Those urologists can do wonders for you. <laughs> you know, I'm an Oklahoma and I live my life by priorities. If the Sooners are playing, I cheer for Oklahoma. Now, if OU is not playing OSU, I cheer for OSU. And if a Big 12 team was playing outside of the Big 12, I cheer for the Big 12 team. So on January 4th, or whatever the date was, I cheered for the Longhorns for the first time in my life. <laughs> for two reasons. For two reasons. There's three Longhorns in the crowd. <laughs> I thought it'd help the Big 12 if they won the national title. Secondly, and far more important, I knew that if they won the national title, Vince Young would leave. <laughs> uh, how many of you this is your first time at Key Man's Conference? Let me see your hand. Okay, that's a good one. Good one. Good one. I just tell you, there's no place like the Key Men's Conference. I, I don't know where it went. Crawford started this how long ago, John? 24 years ago. They told him, you know, you can't do men's conferences like that anymore. And sure enough, it hasn't worked. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, this afternoon, I was part of a large crowd that went over to Roy Robertson. And I've never seen anything like it. Now, I don't know. You know, he is well past 60, I promise you that. <laughs> but I passed a note to the guy sitting by me, and I said, he is incredibly sharp. I mean, this guy is passionate. I don't know how old he is, but they sent him to the mission field 59 years ago. <laughs> That's true. That's true. And he said, this guy is on fire. Where else are you going to go where you have Roy Robertson and Jim Downing and John Crawford uh, you know, guys like Max Barnett kicking around and Bob Potter. And, uh, and then, you know, for those of us who've been coming for a while, there, there are the, the men who aren't here, but we remember when they were here. Now, I remember when Lauren Sandy was here a number of times. And, and uh, a good friend of my dad's, Wayne Watts, lived here in Wichita Falls. He's gone now, but he used to come to this. Bob Seifert used to come to this every year. Gene Ward used to come every year do his question and answer thing. I'll talk about that later on. But if this is your first time, take advantage. You know, if you see someone with gray hair that's, you know, mine is artificial. I turn it gray so people like Chip will buy my investments. But <laughs> <laughs> he needs help. He's a doctor. Okay. <laughs> but when you see these guys with gray hair, or in Crawford's case, a wide part of gray hair. <laughs> this is a place where you can sit down and talk to them. You can go to the workshop. You can eat, eat dinner with them. Eat lunch with them. And I don't know any place on earth that a 14-year-old kid can sit down to a guy that's been walking with God for 70 years and talk to him. So it's a special place. And uh, you know, to be able to speak at this conference is uh, it's just an incredible privilege. I, as Jim said, uh, there, there are no worthy speakers here, at least I'm not one. Um, it's a real privilege to be here. And I always struggle with what I'm going to speak to this crowd about. And so I usually just wind up speaking out of my life, where I'm at that stage of life. About 10 years ago, I spoke on finishing well, and I told the story of an airplane flight that ended up in a crash in Kansas wheat field. I neglected to mention it was really just a flight simulator. But it, it felt real at the time. <laughs> um, a couple of years ago, I was um, I was running for the United States Senate, and so I spoke out of Isaiah 43 about passing through the deep waters. <laughs> and uh, the verse was right. I eventually did pass through those deep waters um, unsuccessfully. But you know, God's in control, and I wouldn't change that outcome of that election if I could or really would. I promise you, my wife and kids wouldn't. <laughs> well, we're back here this year, and I'm not crashing airplanes or battling mightily against the forces of evil in the political world. You know, back then, I, on election night, I got beat pretty bad. 
it's 62, to, I was 25, they'll get 62, 25, 12, for the top three guys. In uh, election night, the reporter said, I was between a guy named Tom Carter, who's a wonderful Christian guy. Uh, he believes the right stuff, goes about it all the wrong way. <laughs> and I was between him and a guy who went big time negative against me, third place guy. And they said, what happened? I said, well, you know, I think I was caught between the Apostle Paul and Jack the Ripper. And there. <laughs> So I'm not crashing airplanes, and I'm not going through political wars. This year is worse. This year, we bought a 100-year-old home. And, and worse than that, we've been living in it, or it's been living on us, for seven months while we remodel it. And so after considerable reflection and talking to my wife about it, we have decided that we do not recommend that process. It's, it's been very difficult, both financially and emotionally. It's hardest on my wife, Danny. You see, I get to leave in the morning. I have a job outside the home. And, and, uh, but she has to stay there. And so every morning at 8 o'clock, if we're lucky, the workmen show up. But that means she has no privacy, and, and there's electricians and plumbers and, and carpenters and painters and an endless stream of people. And uh, she has to deal with that, so she never gets away from it. We don't know which will run out first, my bank account or her patients, <laughs> both being strained. But there's hope. We're only about four weeks from having everything completed. That's the good news. The bad news is that we've been about four weeks from having everything completed for about three months now. <laughs>
If you want a sound building, you have to start with a solid foundation. Now, our home's 100 years old. Completed in 1907, the year Oklahoma became a state. And the old house is solid. It just needs some tender, loving care. But it has a detached garage. You know, when you're the former mayor of the city, and you try to do anything, it's in the paper. And so I, I tried to get a permit to tear down this 100-year-old detached garage, and it was, it was in the paper. <laughs> Ran into a guy here, yeah, you're the one trying to tear down the garage, aren't you? <laughs> so the house is great, it's solid, but, but the, the garage was built as a carriage house for horses and, and wagons. And it was not built at all to the same standard that the main house was. In fact, when I bought it, I asked the, the contractor, I said, how can we fix this thing? Because it, it's never switched direction and it's rotten and and uh, the, the uh, foundation has failed, about three-fourths of it. The stem wall is missing in places. And uh, I said, how can we repair this? And so they dug down under the stem wall, and there's, there's, no, there's no footings. It's just bricks. I guess they just put some bricks in. John, have you ever seen them do that? <laughs> well, it didn't last forever. <laughs> it's lasted very poorly for 100 years, but... Uh, but the, so we hired a structural engineer and he told us in order to save the building we'll have to take it down and put a new foundation under it and then rebuild the building. Well, that's the way it is with our lives. Our structure won't be any stronger than our foundation. And you know, there are plenty of things, plenty of things that we can choose to build our life upon. We can say, you know what, my life is solid because of the family I was born into. I come from a great family. We can say, you know what, I'm doing my life on my intelligence. I'm a smart guy. Or maybe it's, it's your career. And that's what, if, if you scrape your life down to the foundation, you find out that it's your career. Or maybe it's even involvement in a church. Or, you know, for some guys, it's the one loss record of their football team. You know, I, really, in my younger days, if, oh, you lost. I was in a bad mood until about Wednesday. <laughs> but how about you? foundation is your life built on? And if your answer is anything other than a quick, solid, my foundation is Jesus Christ, then you need to ask yourself some serious questions. You know, I wondered, kind of in talking to this crowd about this, an issue as basic as salvation, I thought, gee, well, that's, that's kind of elementary for this crowd. But then I went to Roy Robertson's workshop today, he said, you start with the gospel. And he told that, that when they, uh, I think they were training counselors, if I'm not wrong, in, in the crusade in the Orient, that 11% of the counselors, the people who came to, to counsel, 11% wound up trusting Christ. And I don't know where you are as far as your relationship with Jesus Christ. I don't know if Jesus Christ is the foundation for your life and for your faith. But I'm not going to assume that you have that one straightened out. I know because that's my story. I, I grew up in a home with godly parents. We went to church all the time. When I was a kid, I went to every camp and every conference that the Navigators or the Baptist Church had. So I was busy. My older brother, Kent, is here. He can tell you I needed all of them. But in the spring of 1970, when I was a sophomore at the University of Oklahoma, I was brought face to face with some deep questions about life. Does God really exist? Is the Bible true? Who is Jesus Christ? Is, is Jesus who he claimed to be? Is Jesus the only way to God? And although I'd been reared by deeply committed Christian parents, my own experience was really more of a relationship with the church than a personal relationship with God. And it was as though I was limping through life or attempting to limp through life with one foot in the church and one foot in the world. And as I wrestled with these questions, I came to the conclusion that I had to either get on or get off. Either God is real or He isn't. Either the Bible is God's Word and true or it's not. Either Jesus Christ is who He claimed to be and He made some amazing claims. You know, He did not claim to be a good teacher. He did not claim to be a prophet. He claimed to be God. And more than that, he claimed to be the only way to God. 
So either those things are true, or he's a fraud. And I decided that if God does exist, and if the Bible is his word, and if Jesus is God who came in the flesh and the only way to God, if those things are true, then those deserve to be the foundation of my life. But if they're not true, I thought, you know what? We'll quit playing the game. I mean, you know, if, if, if those things aren't true, then let's just eat and drink and be merry and have a good time because faith is just a fairy tale and we're only here for about 70 years and it's all over. And guys, I, I still feel that way. If it's just a game, don't play it. But if it's not a game, if it's really life, then get serious about it. Well, I discovered the Bible is full of lessons for life. The Bible told me that I had a basic problem. I had turned away from God's direction in my life. And I tried to live life by my rules instead of God's rules. And the Bible calls this sin. And because of my sin, I was not able to rightly relate to God. God was pure. I'm not. God is pure, I'm not. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, I've never run into a person who's had any problem with admitting he was a sinner. We all know that we fall short of God's standards. In fact, truthfully, we even fall short of our own standards, right? I disappoint myself, much less God. But our problem is we think we can fix it on our own. Now that's not very logical. We mess things up trying to run our own lives. And then think, we think we're going to get right with God through our own efforts. That's illogical and impossible. Now some people believe that they know they're a sinner, but they really believe that you don't have to live a perfect life. You just have to do more good than bad during this lifetime. And you, you've heard that, you know, it's kind of the guy who says, well, me and the big fellow upstairs, we have a deal, and, you know, I'm going to do more good than bad, and God does a whole lot of bad stuff. Ask any of my five former wives, they'll tell you that. You know, this guy, but, you know, I, you know I'm a pretty good fellow, and I think he'll let me in. You know, it's the old scales bit. Well, the only problem with that is that the Bible says exactly the opposite. The Bible says that we are made right with God only through faith in Jesus Christ. And that it's by God's grace, it's not because of any good works we do. It says that eternal life, being made right with God, is a gift. And there's nothing we can do for it. We don't deserve it, we can't earn it, but it's not ours until we accept it, receive it. Well, in the spring of 1970, that's what I did. I decided God does exist, and the Bible is His Word, it is true. And that Jesus is who He claimed to be. And so 36 years ago, next month, I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ and asked him to come over and come in and take over my life and change it. And he did. And it changed everything about my life. It changed the way I thought. It changed the way I talked. It changed the kind of young lady that I would date and look to marry. After Dan and I got married, our relationship with Jesus Christ has affected every area of our life. It's changed, our, it, it's affected our relationship, how we conduct ourselves as parents and our grandparents, how I do business, what we do with our time and money, every area of our life. And I'll just tell you, you know, if, if you're not sure about a relationship with Jesus Christ, if you're not sure that the foundation of your life is Jesus Christ, you can straighten that out tonight. You don't uh, have to walk down any aisle. You don't have to be in any church to do it. You can do it right here tonight. And if you have any doubt about that, I would encourage you to get it straight out between you and God. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. The next question is, and I building strategically. Paul has six different kinds of building materials. The first three, gold, silver, precious stones, are expensive and they have lasting value. The last three, wood, hay, straw, are not as expensive and they do not last. 
What Paul is really saying here, I think, is be strategic in how you spend your time and resources. Invest in the things that matter, the things that have lasting value. After we bought our old house, a friend asked me, what was your thought process of buying this house? <laughs> and my answer was, there was none. I mean, why would anyone in their right mind buy a 100-year-old house? Wouldn't it be far easier and far less expensive to build a new one or to buy one that someone else already built for you with everything new? What attracted me to the old house was the materials and the workmanship that you just can't buy in a house today. Anna said, hey, let's go look at that house. I said, I want to buy that house. She said, well, let's go look at it. We walked in there, and John, I thought I was in the castle of Glen Eyre. You know that, that quarter song of oak that they had in the Great Hall of Glen Eyre? This house has woodwork like that. It, the ground floor, most of the floors are quarter song of oak, which you just can't, if you bought it today, it would, it would bankrupt Chipper Williams. <laughs> Up and that's just the way old buildings are. Some years ago, I was looking at buying an old shopping center, and I called Gene Moore and asked his, his counsel. And he told me, he said, you know, old buildings are like old people. They need, they need a lot of maintenance. And that's certainly been true with our home. It's wonderful, and someday it'll be really nice. But too often right now, it's like two steps forward and one step back. And I won't even give you a list of all the things that we've had to deal with, but it's extensive and ongoing. And that's the way it is with fixing up an old life, too. Sometimes, I didn't say an old wife, I said an old wife. Although, you don't have that solid foundation, Jesus Christ. What are you building on? And many times in our lives, we feel like it's two steps forward and one step back. And we wonder if our life is really counting. In Oklahoma County, where we live, we have a wonderful Christian district attorney named Wes Lane. Wes is up for re-election this year and his campaign chairman. So recently, we got together to uh, talk about how do we raise money for the campaign and I was in his office for about two hours, and we never got around to talking about politics. To share around Christ. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about what it's like to be a man in a very visible public position trying to walk with Christ. And really, we came around to this idea of being strategic. Am I being strategic? You know, God has placed Wes in a strategic position. In our county, there's about 600,000 people. And really, day to day, Wes deals with hundreds, of, or if not thousands of people. He runs into them. some in very pleasant circumstances. Others, he's, uh, he's the prosecuting attorney in a capital murder trial. So, he touches people every day. He's in a position where he can touch them with the love and the grace of Jesus Christ. That's a great opportunity. But it's also frustrating. When I was mayor, I felt like I had thousands of relationships and they were about that deep. Maybe you feel that way in your job. Maybe you're a, a teacher or a coach or a business executive or 
a physician or, or a pastor or a plant manager. Maybe you're a counselor. And in your work, you come in con into contact with a large number of people, and that's a great opportunity, but it can also be a great burden if you don't handle it in the right way and view it in the right way. Well, in this passage, Paul encourages us to build with the precious materials, to invest our lives in the things that matter in the long run, the things that have lasting value, to build strategically. And then in our discussion, Wes and I came to the conclusion that God has placed him in this, in this special position in order to touch some people that might not be touched any other way. And we came around to the discussion, you know, Wes, in, in, even in the midst of all you're doing, you know, I bet you there might be some young attorneys in town that would love to meet once a week with the district attorney in a small group and learn about life from this district attorney and learn from learn together from God's Word about how to be a husband, how to be a father, how to be an attorney, how to touch people for Jesus Christ. So, in the midst of all you're doing, are you being strategic? Or are you just being swept along by the time? Now, one day my dad, when I was married, my dad called me up and said, uh, hey, let's get lunch. And so I got with my secretary, and we found out that it was a month before I could have lunch with my dad. <coughs> if you don't plan your life and your use of time, other people will plan it for you. Be strategic. Look at your position and ask yourself, how has God uniquely positioned me and gifted me? What doors are open to me right now that might not be open to other people? You know, Jesus gave us a great example. He, he, he touched and he ministered and he healed and he taught the multitude, thousands of people. But he poured his life into 12. And even more than that, he really poured his life in, you know, in an even deeper way into three. Why? Because he knew the day was coming he'd be here no longer. And the entire impact of his ministry depended on those 12 people. Be strategic. Is my foundation sure? Am I building strategically? And the third question is, am I living abundantly? Now, this question is really not in this passage. You have a foundation, you have a structure, and then the next verse, you have a test by fire. But for most of us, after we build a structure, it's going to be some years before the test by fire really comes. And that's when you're in the, so this, this interim period is when you're in the maintenance stage. Now, even if your home has a solid, solid foundation and a well-built structure, that's not enough because there's all kinds of enemies that would threaten the integrity of your home if you don't take preventive steps. First, there's the weather. We have to protect our homes from the world around it. The wind, and the rain, and the sunshine. And so we caulk, and we paint, and we replace shingles, and we install French drains, and we insulate, and the list goes on and on and on. In order to enjoy our home and our investment in our home, we have to protect it. That's not all. Then there are the predators, both, both human and otherwise. Burglars <laughs> want to get into our homes. We put up fences and, and we uh, have alarm systems. <laughs> and then, you know, there are those four footed burglars, squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> I guess there are some humans that are squirrels. I don't know. <laughs> Insects, all, all trying to get into our home and do damage. And then there are those, those enemies that are, that are invisible and silent, like termites. They, they tunnel underground and they try to destroy our home from the inside out. Well, just, like there, just as there are threats like that to a physical structure, there are threats that would seek to undermine the vitality and integrity of our spiritual life. In John 10, 10, Jesus said, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life. 
Now, Jesus draws a distinction there between life and abundant life, doesn't he? If, you know, if there wasn't, he'd just say, I came to them and have abundant life. That's not what he said. They may have life and have it abundantly. So my question <coughs> today is, if your foundation's right, do you have life or do you are you experiencing abundant life? Am I living abundantly? If you're not experiencing abundant life, it's because you've allowed someone or something steal or kill or destroy some aspect of your life in Christ. You know, maybe, just like around our home, we have a six-foot wrought iron fence. And it's really funny. I mean, the homeless guys live a block from my house. I'm not joking. There's an abandoned hotel a block from my house. And they break in there. In fact, some of these guys, you see, pushing shopping carts by our house. I mean, we live in the hood. <laughs> but they don't ever come up to our door because we have a six-foot wrought iron fence around the whole property. And so they go to my neighbors, which is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so just like physically we put up hedges or we erect fences, we need to put up hedges and erect fences in our spiritual life to protect ourselves from those things that might seek to attack, attack us. After we moved into our home, I did some research on the history of the house. In its first 40 years, it only had two owners. Then starting about 60 years ago, the house began, as the Bible would have said, to suffer much at the hands of many. As I mentioned, for 24 years, it was a boarding house. And then over the remaining 36 years, it had 12 different owners. As my first door neighbor said, it's a three-year house. No one, else, no one can last any longer than that. Well, we think we found out why it's a three-year house. One day after we'd been there a couple of months, we started getting this terrible odor in our master bedroom. And uh, every time the air conditioner would kick on, we'd get this odor. It, it, you know that swamp gas song? <laughs> it was worse than that. It, it smelled like sewer gas. So we called the heat air company and told them about it, and they came out and... They had a fix that would only cost us $800. They said, you've got mold in your heat and air unit, and if you pay us $800 for this light, then it'll fix that mold and the smell will go away. So we paid $800. Bucks. They put the lamp in, and sure enough, it seemed to work for a while. And then about two months later, the odor came back. And finally, one day, I got so fed up that I told my wife, I'm not going to sign another check until we fix that. And so she called the heat and air guys, and they got serious about fixing the problem. Well, we found out, by the way, I'll give you a little, just a little maintenance clue. <laughs> we had a plumber who across the beam was about that wide. And he just wouldn't go back to places. He couldn't get there to where you needed to get. To find it. And we got a little old skinny plumber and he solved the problem. <laughs> So, how about your life, spiritually? 
Are there any old pipes stuck up in the attic somewhere that keep ruining your day? And the only way to deal with them is to rip them out and put them in. Just rip them out. Are there any places in your life where the squirrels get into the attic and pull the wires? Or are you allowing termites to work underground and undermine your life spiritually? You know, uh, you, you probably saw on TV that our uh, Coach at Oklahoma State this week, Eddie Sutton, uh, had a wreck and uh, was charged with driving under the influence. In fact, it came out today as blood alcohol content was about three times the legal limit. And I know Eddie Sutton. And, and I, I just tell you, he's a wonderful man. And I believe he's a believer. I have no doubt of that. Uh, but Eddie struggled with alcohol some years ago. And He's having a lot of back pain lately, and he took uh, painkillers, and that didn't do it. And I don't know when it was, but at some time, at some point over the time, Eddie turned back to alcohol. It's not important whether it's a one-time occurrence or not. That's not the point. The point is this. When we allow sin in our life, we think it's sin. It won't stay secret. There's no way Eddie would have made the decisions he made if he knew that he'd pay the price that he's having to pay. And that his family would have to pay the price that he's having to pay. His university industry. No way. And guys, there's no way when we allow <clears throat> greed, when we allow bitterness, when we allow lust, to stay in our lives and we feed it secretly a little bit. And we think, oh, nobody knows it. Well, God knows it. And you know it. Even if you're in denial about it, you know it. And one of these days, everybody's going to know it. There's no such thing as a secret sin. And you know, I don't know if you've ever had it happen, but if you've ever poked at a place on the wall and termites have been in there and it goes, Folks right through. They've eaten everything but the paint. And that's what happens in our lives. And some some day something comes along and life pokes at us and we just go right on through because the termites of sin have been undermining us silently for years. Am I living abundantly? Well, how do you, how do you maintain a life? How do you make sure that the things that you do and the building you built and the years of the right kind of investment are not undermined by sin and carelessness. And the answer is simple but difficult. I've heard it said here, the least common denominator for a man walking with God is a daily devotional life. When I was in, uh, in 1970, I got saved and, and uh, uh, really interested. You know, guys, truth doesn't change. You know, Roy Robertson said today that uh, when they got a new convert, he said someone asked Austin Trotman, how long is it before you teach a new convert to start memorizing scripture? And Austin said, you mean how many minutes or how many seconds? <laughs> and so Roy would have a person memorize when they counseled them, they would have them Memorize the verse before they left. <clears throat> when I got saved in 1970, uh, I thought I rededicated my life. You know, it's really hard, fellas, to rededicate something you've never dedicated. <laughs> but that week, I was at Glen Airy, the Max Barnett's group, took those college kids up there, and Jim Williams and I were sitting in a hallway. I don't know if you remember this, Jim, but I do. And a guy had spoken that morning and he said, you know, if you don't do anything the rest of the day, memorize this verse, Philippians 4.19. And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So I thought that morning, man, yeah, I memorized it first. Well, that afternoon I had lunch, I forgot about it, and Chip goes, well, we better get to work on that verse. And I thought, what verse? <laughs> but really, and 
Chip wasn't discipling me. He, he was as goofy as I was. <laughs> and see if there be any wicked way in me that lead me in the way everlasting. And if you'll open up your heart and allow God to search and tell you what he puts his finger on, he'll do that. <coughs> Colossians 2, 6 and 7, just as you trusted Christ to save, you trust him too for each day's problems. Well, how did we trust Christ to save us? By faith, not by works. See, our problem is we get saved by faith and then want to live by <coughs> works. And it won't work that way. It says, let your roots grow down into him and draw up nourishment from him. See that you go on growing in the Lord and become strong and vigorous in the truth you are taught. Let your lives overflow with joy and thanksgiving for all that. Walk by faith. Is my foundation sure? Am I building strategically? Am I living abundantly? And the fourth question, am I ready for the day? Picking up in 1 Corinthians 3.12. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each man's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it. Because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work which any man has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. You know, the picture I get there is, if all your work's burned up, you get into heaven, but all your hair and eyebrows are singed off. You know, that's not much of a way to meet God. You know, and on that day, the only thing that will matter will be God's account. It won't matter how much money you left behind. Which, by the way, is very flammable. It won't matter what title you had. It won't matter what awards you were given. It won't matter how big your office was or how, where it was located. The only thing that will matter on that day is whether what you built on the foundation of Jesus Christ stood the test of the fire. We're not talking about salvation here. You know, if you scrape all that stuff away and you still have that foundation of Jesus Christ, you're into heaven. 
were just talking about whether your life counts. Now, the big problem here is we don't know when the day is, but it's coming. I'm 55 years old. I might have another 20 years, maybe another 30 years, maybe longer. Or I might not be here next year, guys. There's probably some 14-year-old guys here. You may live for another 70, 80 years. There's some here in the room that uh, are about that age. In their 80s, in their 90s. We don't know when it's going to be, but I'll promise for some of us, we won't be here next year. And that day's coming. So we have to live every day as if it's our last day. And in a very real sense it is because every day is a 24-hour gift from God. It's 24 hours. It's a gift from Him. It's irreplaceable. You can only live it once. I mentioned Gene Ward. How many of you have heard Gene speak at this conference before? Quite a few. Uh, he's had a real ministry in, the, in many of our lives. When, when we were kids, uh, Gene was like a member of the family to us. In fact, we called him Uncle Gene. When Dan and I were newly married, Gene and Irma played a major role in helping us get underway in life, teaching us you know, how to be a husband, how to be a wife. How to, how to walk with God, how to be parents, how to handle money, how to make money. <clears throat> the first few times I ever stood up and spoke in front of a crowd, it was at a workshop that Gene assigned to me. He didn't give you much choice. He just said, here's yours. <laughs> well, so then he, well, no, he, he'd say, okay, I want to hear your workshop. And he, he'd make us give it to him before he gave the workshop. And then when we gave it to a live, live studio audience, he'd show up. And then afterwards, he'd critique us. <laughs> He was tough, loving, generous, hard-headed. He was a taskmaster. But we knew that he loved us. And we loved him. And I remember sitting right here in this room a few years ago. Gene would, I think on Saturday night, do his patented question and answer. And if you knew Gene, you know, it was like a cowboy coming into town with both guns blazing. <laughs> Dead bodies everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> But he'd get a question, he'd just start quoting verses, just right at that tap. And this night, it may be five years ago, five, six years ago, it didn't happen that way. And I sat out there and I, and I watched Gene struggle with the verses. And I thought, you know, there's something wrong here. And there was something wrong. That, that was the beginning of the dementia that has since taken over Gene's life. And he's still alive, but he's been bed fast for years. And, and, uh, I've been to see him with Bob Potter a number of times. And I don't know if he knows you, Bob. I know he doesn't know me. But Gene used to keep track of the days of his life, and he said, you know, we're promised the best three score and ten, so he'd count down those days, and by God's grace, he got a few more days than that. But one of these days, the day is coming in Gene's life, and he'll stand before the Father and show what he did for the foundation of Jesus Christ and what he built on. I think that Gene's going to hear the words, well done. But we never know when that day's coming. For some of us, we may have 15, 20, maybe even 30 years. But the question is, are you ready for that day? There won't be any secrets on that day. It says the day will disclose it because it will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So we're back to four questions. Is my foundation sure? Am I building strategic, strategically? Am I living abundantly? And am I ready for the day? I'll promise you there's some men in this room and over in the next room that have been playing church but have never gotten to the place where they put all their weight on Jesus Christ. And if that's you, Deal with that tonight. And then there are many of us that would say, you know what, I'm really not building strategically. A lot of the things I'm giving my time and my resources to really are wood, hay, and straw. And if that's the case in your life, 
And that's certainly the case. In life. That's an adjustment we need to make and, and say, God, teach me to invest in the things that have lasting value. <clears throat> Am I living abundantly? Is there anything in your life that's playing with the world and the That's stealing or destroying your abundant life in Christ? Today's coming when we'll stand before God. He won't really ask us to give account. He'll just say, here it comes. What's left will be what? This is lasting value. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We certainly don't deserve the gift of salvation in Christ, but we thank you for that. Father, we don't deserve your grace day by day. We don't deserve your forgiveness. We don't deserve a fresh start, but God, I thank you that you are a God of redemption. You are a God who forgives, and you are a God who says, you know what, we can move from this point forward. Father, I thank you for the key men's conference and the fact that we can see men who've lived many more years walking with you than we have and see that we can do that too. And I thank you for the truth that we're going to hear in these days. God, I pray that truth would be burned into our hearts. <coughs> And that we'd have hearts that are eager to listen for your word and then to do it. In Jesus' name. Amen. He lost those numbers. I don't know. That guy blew it last night. We fired him. <laughs> I, changed, I changed my phone number. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see here. Then tomorrow morning at 1040, we'll be meeting in this room for a chat. Right here, 1040, and we'll hear from Brother Crawford. And then we have lunch, and then we have free time, and then we have uh, prayer groups at 3 o'clock. So meet your prayer group at 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. And then we have our, our second, last workshop, and that's page 11. Turn there, we've got some changes. Saturday afternoon, staying quarterly, starting at 7. If you play guitar or something fun, you can show up at 6.30 and rehearse. That, that boy, everybody show up. <coughs> then, uh, let's see, uh, just a couple other things. We'll break the coffee here. Um, registration. Uh, be sure if you haven't registered, we need you to register out here in the hallway um, because uh, we need the money. <laughs> and uh, also, those of you who are at the... Uh, in the hotel motels, you're responsible for your own checkout and your own telephone call. So just be aware of that. Then, uh, also about that's that Pete Moss thing you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello. Hello. Who is this? What'd you say? Is this Dr. Marvin Williams? Uh, oh, Mac Williams. Mac Williams. Yeah, yeah well, Mac. Uh, <laughs> I was wondering if your mayor showed up there yet. <laughs> you mean uh, uh, Humphreys, the former mayor? Yeah, that's a uh, government bureaucrat guy there. <laughs>
Thanks a lot, Pete.